Please take your Bibles and turn back to that portion of Scripture that we read just a moment ago. We are in the book of Exodus, chapter 15, looking at the first 15 verses. Today we have part four of Sing Unto the Lord. It tells us in that very first verse, Then sang Moses and the children of Israel this song, saying, I will sing unto the Lord. <laughs> so singing unto the Lord was rather important in our text, and I trust that you will discover why when we complete this series. Now, we're not going to get all the rest of the way through it today. I do appreciate your prayers as I fly to Mexico this week to speak at the ICCC Aledic Congress, uh, which is down there, held about once every four to six years and uh, looking forward very much to having fellowship with other fundamental pastors and leaders from around the world. But we'll be doing this series probably for another four or five weeks because we're talking about music and the Bible. It's a very important topic. We saw that the Song of Moses, which is found in Exodus 15, is also recorded for us in one other passage of Scripture. Where else do we find it? What's the book and chapter? Revelation, Revelation chapter? 15. Easy to remember, isn't it? Exodus 15, Revelation 15. It mentions the Song of Moses and the Song of the Lamb. The Song of Moses deals with Israel in the Old Testament. The Song of the Lamb deals with the Lord Jesus Christ and the church in the New Testament. Very important, and we will study that, the Lord willing, when we uh, cover the book of Revelation, which will be starting in several weeks uh, in the evening worship service. Now, what we've seen so far... We've seen that music plays a very key role in the Bible, both in the Old Testament and in the New Testament. That's principally because God himself is a musical being, and we saw in Zephaniah chapter 317 that the Lord God will joy over us with singing. Marvelous. God himself sings. What beautiful music that must be. Heaven shudders in awe. It trembles with joy as it hears the Lord sing. Think about that. Our God sings, and it says he sings over us. You know how you, who have been mothers, have sung over your babies? You held them, and you sang. They were songs of love, of tenderness, of gentleness. The Lord sings over us as his children. But in the text, it tells us here, in our text in Exodus, that the Lord is a man of war. He sings battle songs as well. He sings victory songs. You think about the various songs that are sung, from the halls of Montezuma to the shores of Tripoli. We will fight our country's battles in the land, on air, in air, on in sea. You know, those are songs. Those are battle songs. Our Lord sings battle songs, too, because he is a man of war. Our Lord sings over us. Magnificent, beautiful picture. The Bible also tells us that the devil is a musical being. In both Isaiah and Ezekiel, we discovered that he actually has musical organs built into his spirit body. Two musical instruments are mentioned in Ezekiel 28, verses 12 through 19. Verse 13 says, The workmanship of thy tabrets and of thy pipes was prepared in thee in the day that thou wast created. Now we've already studied that word for tabrets. The tabrets that are there are like a tambourine or a timbrel, an instrument that is used to produce rhythm and beat. But I have some new material for you today. I told you that we were going to postpone looking at that second word for a couple of weeks, and so we have it today. The second instrument that is built into Satan that Ezekiel lists here is the word called pipes. Notice that the word pipes is in the plural. This is a fascinating word. This is the Hebrew word nekev. Nekev, if you're trying to write it down and spell it out, that's N as in Nancy, E as in Edward, Q as in Quincy, E as in Edward, V as in Victor. Nekev, the V is a V sound. That word means a bezel. How many of you know what a bezel is? <laughs> Nobody knows what a bezel is? You ought to know. It, it relates to a tool. What kind of a tool? A chisel, for example, has a bezel. A bezel is the sloping edge or face on a cutting tool like a chisel. That is the Hebrew word nekev. It also refers, and here is a fascinating one, because it takes a very sharp tool to cut this. 
It refers to the oblique side or face of a cut gem. Now, some of you in here are wearing diamonds. Even tiny diamonds, they don't just sort of, oh, well, here's a diamond, and they just sort of stick it in the ring. A man who cuts gems looks through his loop, through the little magnifying glass things that he wears. He holds it with a very special substance, very firmly, on another little rod that sticks up, and then he grinds the surfaces exactly so. He has to follow all of the internal structure of the diamond to make sure that he doesn't ruin it. And he cuts a precise number of bevels on the surface of the diamond. Some of you have maybe had a, a cubic zirconia, which looks like a diamond. And you look at that, and man, it's big rocks in here, a one carat thing sitting on your finger, cost $25. <laughs> you know, if you had something that was a real one sitting on your finger like that, it would cost thousands and thousands of dollars. And as you look at it, You've got a flat surface on top, then you've got bevels that are cut all the way around the outside edge at the top, and then longer bevels that are cut on the bottom side of it. That's the word that we have here. A bezel is a sloping edge or face of a cutting tool like a chisel, but it also refers to the oblique side, that is that beveled side, or the face of the cut gem. Specifically, the upper faceted portion of a brillant, that's a specific type of cut, a brilliant cut projecting from the setting. You have something very, very beautiful. The word nekev comes from the primary Hebrew root nakav. Ah, uh, now here's where we begin to learn some other things. Because remember, this, this is used of Satan. Nakav, which means to puncture or perforate with violence. Hmm. It's the same. That's what that word used for you're cutting off the edges of a diamond to make it beautiful. But it actually comes from a root that means to puncture or perforate with violence. It's a word that also, listen to this, in various contexts in the Bible is used to translate to blaspheme or to curse. Just like you're knocking things off with a chisel. Like you knock the honor off of God. You knock the honor off of someone else means to blaspheme or to curse. You know, this word this translated pipes here is different from various other words in the Old Testament, translated pipes. Principally, the word that we find translated pipes is chayil, a flute, used to translate other musical instruments, and they are also referred to as pipes. So it's of great interest that the word nekev is not the, is the word that's used here in Ezekiel not the normal word for pipes? Nekev has reference to one, a sharp cutting instrument, two, a beautiful facet of a gemstone that catches and reflects light, three, a root that means to puncture with violence, to blaspheme or curse. Because all of those elements are seen in Satan. If we did a thorough study of scripture on the devil, we would discover every one of those elements seen in Satan. And God, in inspiring the scripture, chose a word that expresses all of the devil's principal character elements. He's musical. He's like a sharp cutting instrument. According to Ezekiel, he's the sum of created beauty that God made. His name, Lucifer, means light bearer, just like that gemstone reflects light beautifully. He punctures with violence. He's the original blasphemer and cursor. And so it is most appropriate this specific word for pipes built into Satan should be used in this context. Now the other kinds of pipes of either the recorder type, some of you know what a recorder is. I'm not talking about a tape recorder. <laughs> I'm talking about the musical instrument a recorder. Uh, we used to have one of these around our house when I was a little kid. Uh, wonderful to play. Uh, it's like a little s slender wooden pipe with a, a mouthpiece on the top and it has little holes in it and you can play up and down the scale on the recorder and we learned to do that as kids. Many schools today have plastic ones of those to teach kids in music class. Uh, some, some of the words that are used for pipe are those kinds 
lines of pipes. Others are more like the pan pipes. You know what pan pipes are? It's a whole series of little pieces like of bamboo all wired together. They're different lengths with a little slit in the top and when you blow into the top of it, uh, each one of those different ones, like a harmonica, uh, produces a different note. Instead of having little finger holes that you you know, close and open, uh, it produces it just because the pipes are of different length. Sort of like on an organ. Organ pipes are of different lengths and different sizes around, and they can produce all kinds of different sounds, as you know. So other types of pipes that are mentioned in relation to music, but which are not the same word that we find over here in uh, Ezekiel. For example, 1 Kings chapter 1, verse 40, And all the people came after him, and the people piped with pipes, and rejoiced with great joy, so that the earth rent with the sound of them. It's pretty loud if the earth is tearing up at the sound that they're making off of their pipes. But it's a different word for pipes. It's the word nakil, the one that deals with the flutes. Jeremiah 46, 36, 48, 36. Therefore mine heart shall sound from Moab with pipes, and mine heart shall sound like pipes for the men of Kehiris, because the riches that he hath gotten are perished. Here is pipes that are playing sorrowful notes, sad notes. They're coming from the heart. Mine heart shall sound for Moab. Mine heart shall sound like pipes for the men of Kehiris. Hebrew musical and poetic pluralism, by the way, is seen there in that uh, Jeremiah passage that I just read for you. Um, because music and poetry in Hebrew go hand in hand. And there are huge amounts of Hebrew poetry that we're only now beginning to understand how it's structured. I actually did a whole series on this at the Dean Bergen Society this past summer, uh, talking about the Hebrew poetry in the Old Testament and how come we don't translate it like English poetry, you know. Mary had a little lamb, a little bread, a little jam, that kind of stuff where everything rhymes. Uh, that's not the way Hebrew poetry works. And uh, maybe I'll share some of that stuff with you all later. But anyway, uh, I'm going to talk about that in the context of the music here in First. Uh, in Exodus chapter 15. 1 Samuel chapter 10, verse 5. And after that thou shalt come to the hill of God, where the garrison of the Philistines is, and it shall come to pass, when thou art come thither to the city, that thou shalt meet a company of prophets coming down from the high place, with a psaltery and a tabret and a pipe and a harp. Four different kinds of musical instruments. Some produce rhythm, some produce harmony, some produce melody, the three elements of music. Isaiah chapter 5, verse 12, And the harp, and the viol, and the tabret, and the pipe, and wine are in their feast, but they regard not the work of the Lord, neither consider the operation of his hands. Pipe again is mentioned here, but a different word than the word that we find described in the devil's body. Isaiah 30, 29, Ye shall have a song as in the night with a holy solemnity is kept, and gladness of heart as when one goeth with a pipe to come to the mountain of the Lord, to the mighty one of Israel different pipes used when you're going to the mountain of the Lord with solemnity to worship God. Different than what we find built into the devil because he doesn't come to the mountain of the Lord to worship God. That should tip us off right away that there must be some kind of a difference because in these other passages we see the worship of the Lord involved and a different word is used for the pipes. The New Testament also refers to pipes as musical instruments. 1 Corinthians chapter 14 verse 7. The context you know chapters 12 through 14 the Apostle Paul is talking about the spiritual gifts. He's talking about the superior gifts He's talking about the inferior gifts. In the middle of that, chapter 13 is what's known as the great love chapter of the New Testament. So chapter 12, spiritual gifts. Chapter 14, spiritual gifts. Chapter 14, focusing especially on the gifts of prophecy versus tongues and interpretation of tongues. Chapter 12 gives us a list of different spiritual gifts and how they are to interact and interface in the body of Christ. That's important because when he gets to chapter 14, he's going to talk about which are the gifts that edify and what are the gifts that don't edify unless something else is present. Now, here we have it, chapter 14. So he's talking about now tongues and how if somebody stands up and babbles in tongues and carries on like a charismatic wiggle worm, it is no good 
if there is not someone who can translate it. And tongues in the Bible always refers to a known human language. People talk about, oh, the other charismatics do, it must be angelic tongues because I speak with the tongues of men and of angels and have not charity. Okay, let's ask ourselves a question. Every time an angel speaks in scripture, does he babble in something that the people can't understand or does he speak a human language that his hearer can understand? He speaks a human language that his hearer can understand. The point of language is communication. And so now look, we're in cha chapter 14, verse 7. And so Paul says, now look, we're talking about tongues and prophecy and, you know, how to bring conviction to the church and edification to the church. He says, but if you're out there babbling around like an idiot and nobody understands what you're saying, what good is it? And he says in verse 7, and even things without life, giving sound whether pipe or harp that's here we are we're talking about pipes here or harp except they give now listen to this phrase a distinction in the sounds how shall it be known what is piped or harped Paul's laying down a number of very important principles here for us and he's talking about musical instruments pipes note well He's speaking here in the context of the gift of tongues. Just like the speaking gifts, including tongues, he says they were to give an articulate, understandable, biblical message in the language of the listener. That's the whole point of the tongues versus prophecy controversy that Paul's dealing with there in chapter 14. They have to give an articulate, understandable, biblical message in the language of the listener. And he compares it directly with musical instruments. So the purpose of musical instruments is also to give an articulate, understandable, biblical message to the listener. Folks, you can't miss that point that Paul's making here in 1 Corinthians 14. Because he parallels music with speech. Did you get that? He parallels music with speech. And just like there is gibberish in language there is gibberish in music the question is are you able to discern the difference because he says the things have to give a distinction in sounds let me give you an example for example rock music with its decibel ratings that are off the scales doesn't do that new age music that merely floats along with no structure fails to do this there must be a distinction in the sounds. Paul uses the Greek words here, aulos, which is the word, the piped here, from aleo, which is the verbal form, which is referring to a flute that is blown. Now, you know, a lot of you have probably heard train whistles. Ah, ah, or you hear the thing that goes off down at the firehouse. Ah, ah. It's not very beautiful. But you know what? You know what it means, don't you? You know, you better get off the track in the first instance. And you know, in the second instance, you better get off the road because a fire truck is going to come running down the road. It doesn't have the most beautiful thing in the world, but it lets you know with clarity and with distinction what is about to happen. Just like the difference between here's the troops on the front lines. All the soldiers have got their spears. All the swordsmen have got their swords. Or maybe you got... World War I, and you got the cannoneers with their cannons, and you got the cavalry on the horseback. And so the bugler stands up at the front of the line, and he goes, Would that cause confusion? Yes, because that is not the signal for charge. Charge! you got to give the right signal. And music can do that, and it can move entire armies. We have an army. It's the army of the Lord Jesus Christ. And the devil wants us to hear taps. Time to go to sleep. Turn out the lights. 
Let the sentries go back to the barracks. Let down your guard, open the gates. Makes it easy for the enemy to come in. Do you understand the point that the Apostle Paul is trying to make here in 1 Corinthians chapter 14? Okay, now let me review very quickly, because our time is flying by, the musical principles that we've learned thus far. First, God ordained musical instruments to be used in divine worship, unlike the theology that says that only unaccompanied choral music is permissible. In the Bible, we've seen that there are musics representing all three basic elements of music, melody, harmony, and rhythm. So it's not the category of instruments, but as I hope we see by the end of this series, it's the balance between the rhythmic, melodic, and harmonic instruments and the specific message that they are sending. Number two. The second thing we learned was music is seen in Scripture as a vehicle for giving honor. We saw that in at least one case in 1 Samuel 18, 6 through 16, it caused jealousy in the heart of another person, Saul, who thought that he should have had the honor instead of David. We saw that the honor that is given by the music can be for a man. You know, there's a lot of so-called Christian artists out there who are doing their thing with their music because they want to receive honor for themselves. That's a serious issue, folks, because all glory belongs to God. Does the music point to the individual, or does it honor God? The honor can be for a man. In that case, it, was, it produced a jealousy in another man. The honor that was given to David in the songs of the women. Saul hath slain his thousands, but David his ten thousands, and Saul got mad about that. Or the honor can be for God, which, in our case before us, that results in jealousy in Satan's heart because Satan wants to twist the music in a way that gives the devil honor rather than giving God the honor. Third, the third thing we learned is music is seen in the Bible as a means of spiritual and emotional healing even when the suffering comes from an evil spirit. We saw that in the case of at least one person where God himself sent an evil spirit as a judgment on Saul for rejecting the word of the Lord. That's over in 1 Samuel 16, verse 14. We also notice in that context, verses 16 and 17, that the right kind of music not only gave personal healing, but it also drove away demonic spirits, and that the wrong kind of music attracts demonic spirits. In that context, we also saw that Satan can cause suffering for two reasons. One, either as an instrument of growth, as in the case of Job, we discussed him in earlier messages, or two, as an instrument of chastening, as in the hand of Saul. That's the two main reasons, there are others, but the two main reasons that people go through suffering, either as an instrument of growth or as an instrument of chastening. Sometimes we simply suffer because of our own stupidity. However, it is also true that music in its of itself is not a panacea for all spiritual and emotional healing, but the right kind of music will definitely help. Fourth, the fourth thing you've learned. Having the right kind of instruments does not therefore make the music right. The question is, because Satan has beautiful instruments built into him, just having the right instruments doesn't necessarily make the way you use the instruments right. Israel was using all the correct instruments, but still went into captivity. Isaiah chapter 5, beginning in verse 11. Woe unto them that rise up early in the morning, that they may follow strong drink, that continue until night, till wine inflame them. And the harp, and the viol, and the tabret, and the pipe, and the wine are in their feast. Well, those are the four things that were used by the prophets and the sons of the prophets that were coming down who met Saul, coming to meet Samuel for his anointing. Having the same instruments doesn't necessarily make it right. Having the music played by a symphony orchestra does not make the music right, or playing on a guitar does not make it wrong. I illustrated that to you last week with a book that I published many years ago called Hitler's Wagner. Hitler loved Wagner because Wagner embodied Hitler's ideals. Wagner's music pushed hatred for the Jews, the evolutionary idea that the Aryan race was further evolved than the other races. Therefore, it was morally permissible for superior races to annihilate inferior races in the Darwinian survival of the fittest. 
Wagner promoted atheistic humanism. It was only when it began to understand the power of music to control the mind and the body and the emotions and the will, which can compel you to do certain things. I gave you some illustrations that I decided I wasn't going to listen to Wagner's music anymore. Wagner was an atheist, a white supremacist, a thoroughgoing evolutionist, an anti-Semite with a totally naturalistic, self-preserving, at all costs, humanistic worldview. So I refused to listen to his music anymore. I want to emphasize something else again, because this has affected humongous numbers of Christian employees. It doesn't matter where you go, into what store you go, even the rinky-dinky stores, they play background music, don't they? You know they do. Why do they do it? They have different purposes. Fast food joints always play kind of jittery kind of music because they want you to eat and get out, eat and get out, eat and get out. They want to pull more people in, more people in, and run them through, run them through, run them through. They don't play soothing music that makes you relax <laughs> and enjoy your food. You get on elevators, they play Muzak. They play this kind of stuff that is supposed to wake you up so that whenever you get out to your office or wherever you're going for your business appointment, you know, you're gonna be, you're gonna be wired. Music affects the body, it affects the soul, it affects the mind, it affects the spirit. But now, many of you have to work in places where they play music. Uh, I got a text message last week from someone who said, I'm so, no, I'm, glad, I'm so glad that I no longer have to work in the place that I used to have to work because the music was so bad, so irritating, that I ended up wearing earphones all day long so that I wouldn't have to listen to it. You know like the things that those guys wear on construction sites so I don't hear the horrible noises of the big machinery? This person had to wear earphones at work. It was so bad. But most of us just assume, well, I work here, I gotta listen to the music. And so we think we're tuning it out. Folks, you're not tuning it out, your spirit's not tuning it out, your soul's not tuning it out, and your body's not tuning it out. It is causing an effect on your body, your mind, your soul, your spirit. It does that, and it's been proved so by scientific studies. So a talented musician, whether a great violinist or a rock star, can with great clarity express his worldview or the worldview of the composer who wrote the music. Since I reject Wagner's worldview, I therefore will not listen to his music. Now most of you have never heard of Wagner. Uh, and I'm going to give you <laughs> interesting, uh, I got a couple more text messages this week from somebody else who uh, was asking about these questions. Um, the business of worldview, the communication of the worldview. Someone with a wrong worldview who performs music written by a composer with a right view world worldview can faithfully communicate the truth musically, just like a gifted pagan can read the Bible aloud with expressive power. Believers ought to be reading the Bible aloud with expressive power. I try to do that. I'm not very good at it, but I sure try. To read with expressive power because this is the very word of God. Why should we make it dull to our listeners? And yet you go to some churches and they get up for the scripture reading and they open their Bibles and they say, grace be unto you and peace. From God our Father and from the Lord Jesus Christ. That's sin. The Word of God is quick and powerful and sharper than any two edged sword, piercing even to the dividing asunder of soul and spirit and of the joints and marrow, and is a discerner of the thoughts and intents of the heart. It's alive. Don't read it like it's a corpse. Sorry, I got away preaching there. Back to music. What the church fails at large to understand generally in this context is that a Christian with a Christian worldview who performs so-called Christian music that imitates the music of the world, music which is specifically designed to communicate a pagan world view, when a Christian does that, he is not in fact performing Christian music. He is instead confusing other Christians who say, but it's a Christian artist, so it must be okay. And when he does this, he's foolishly dragging other Christians into a mindset that is open to receive pagan philosophy. We talked last week about some of the Christian recording labels 
who understand that and exploit that among stupid Christians. They've developed what they call crossover music, where the Christian artist performs it. The audience thinks he or she is talking about Jesus. It sounds just like their favorite rock star, but the name of Jesus is never mentioned, and everything is fuzzy in the lyrics, talking about love. But if a pagan was performing the exact same song in a nightclub, the patrons would think that he's singing about passionate love between a man and a woman. That's not Christian music, folks. Now, I know most of you never heard of Wagner, but uh, he did use his skill to state his philosophy of life in a very powerful way. So summary of point four. Having the right kind of instrument does not therefore make the music right. The question is, for what legitimate purpose is the music being used? And can this particular purpose and music be used for the legitimate purpose? Last week I gave the example of arguing that you could use a striptease show to present the gospel to lecherous porn users. Is that the means of a legitimate means for a legitimate purpose? No, because the end does not justify the means. The means and the purpose must both be legitimate. We move now to new principles of music with principle number five. First, let me explain what I'm trying to do with this series. After my sermon last week, I received two text messages. The first was a question. Question one, so is Mozart not someone we should listen to? As I read about him, there is nothing that says he wrote to share his faith. Just trying to look into what you spoke about this morning. I love music, but I want to be honoring God with what I listen to, so I'm trying to do some of my own research." Unquote. Here's what I texted back. And I hope you get this, because this is the whole point of this series. Answer, I'm trying to teach biblical principles of music discernment and let the Holy Spirit bring conviction to each person and give direction about specific composers and pieces. I am less concerned about most of the classical composers than I am about CCM, which is contemporary Christian music, because that is where the problem is in the church today. You know, I don't have a problem with you guys listening to the wrong classical composers. I discovered that when I mentioned Wagner. Nobody had ever even heard of him. That's not where the problem in the church today. Most of the young people are in the church today. They're not into the bad classical composers. They're into CCM. So what I'm concerned about as I'm giving this series of messages is about where the problem in the church is. Most of the classical composers followed biblical principles, even the Roman Catholic composers. So then I got back a second question. Here's question two. Sorry, another question. So if the person is a strong Christian with the intent to only honor God, then the music is okay to listen to, correct? Or is there more to it that I am missing? Yes, <laughs> there's more to it than they were missing. Answer. This is what I texted back. That's the next point that I'll be covering next week. There are sincere Christians who are ignorant, but that sincerity does not make their ignorance okay. So here's our fifth point. <clears throat> this is brand new if you're taking notes. Music must glorify God. The music itself must glorify God. Paul exhorts, this is 1 Corinthians 10, 31, whether therefore ye eat or drink, those are very mundane, common things, as is music. Or whatsoever ye do, that definitely covers music. Whatsoever ye do, do all to the glory of God. God doesn't call us to be in neutral. He certainly doesn't want us to be in reverse. We have to be positively glorifying God in what we are doing. The Lord willing, I'll be preaching a message on that very passage in Mexico this week, and so I have a lot to say on the subject about doing all to the glory of God. Can't cover that this morning, but let me first give you some passages which define what is the result of failure to glorify God. Point number one, the absence of music that glorifies God is a sign of judgment and desolation. The absence of music that glorifies God is a sign of judgment and desolation. In the context of a discussion about the Great Tribulation and the return of Christ to rule on the earth, Isaiah writes, this is Isaiah chapter 40, uh, 24, beginning in verse 1, 
Behold, the Lord maketh the earth empty and maketh it waste, and turneth it upside down and scattereth abroad the inhabitants of the other. We're talking about the great tribulation period here. And it shall be as with all the people, so with the priest, as with the servants, so with the master, so with the maid, so with her mistress, as with the buyer, so with the seller, as with the lender, so with the borrower, as with the taker of usury, so with the giver of usury. The land shall be utterly emptied, utterly spoiled, for the Lord has spoken his word. Here's judgment. We got judgment. The passage is judgment. The earth mourneth and fadeth away. The world languisheth and fadeth away. The haughty people of the earth do language. The earth also is defiled under the inhabitants thereof, because they have transgressed the laws, changed the ordinance, broken the everlasting covenant. Therefore hath the curse devoured the earth, and they that dwell therein shall be desolate. Therefore the inhabitants of the earth are burned, and few men left. The new mind mourneth, the vine languisheth. All the merry hearted is sigh. Now listen to verse 8. The mirth of tabrets ceaseth. The noise of them that rejoiceth endeth. The joy of the harp seeketh. They shall not drink wine with a song. Strong drink shall be bitter to them that drink it. It's judgment, and there's lack of music. The absence of music is a sign of the judgment of God. I hope to develop that theme, the Lord willing, when we study the book of Revelation and look at the music that we find on earth at that time. In contrast to the music that's going on in heaven at that time. I'm going to hold that discussion till then, but I'm going to give you one example to think about, and then we'll have to close with this example. My, there's so much more. Uh, Revelation chapter 18, verse 21. And with a mighty angel took a stone like a great millstone and cast it into the sea, saying, Thus with violence shall that great city Babylon be thrown down, and shall be found no more it at all. There are two Babylons, one in chapter 17, one in chapter 18. We're in chapter 18 here. In verse 22, And the voice of harpers, and musicians, and of pipers, and trumpeters shall be heard no more at all in thee. sign of judgment sign of judgment he goes on and he talks about the other things that we would normally expect in a city well if whatsoever craft he be no craftsman shall be found any more at all in thee and the sound of the millstone shall be heard no more at all in thee and the light of the candle shall shine no more at all in thee and the voice of the bridegroom and the bride shall be heard no more at all in thee for the merchants were the great men of the earth for by thy sorceries thy drugs Pharmacaea, were all nations deceived, and in her, in Babylon, was found the blood of prophets and of saints and of all that were slain upon the earth. That's why God's judging. Absence of godly music during a judgment is one of the great principal themes of Psalm 137. By the rivers of Babylon we sat down, yea, we wept. When we remembered Zion, we hanged our harps upon the willows in the midst thereof. For there they that carried us away captive required of us a song. Look, when you've got joy in your heart, you have a song. But they're in captivity. They're in Babylon. They're under judgment. And they that wasted us required of us mirth, saying, Sing us one of the songs of Zion. How shall we sing the Lord's song in a strange land? If I forget thee, O Jerusalem, let my right hand forget her cunning. If I do not remember thee, let my, the tongue cleave to the roof of my mouth. If I prefer not Jerusalem above my chief joy. And you know the response? Remember, O Lord, the children of Edom in the day of Jerusalem, who said, Raise it, raise it, even to the foundation thereof. O daughter of Babylon, who art to be destroyed, happy shall he be that rewardeth thee as thou hast served us. Happy shall he be that taketh and dashes thy little ones against the stones. Incredible context in which we find no music. Remember, Point five, the absence of music that glorifies God is a sign of judgment and desolation. We'll talk about doing all to the glory of God, the Lord willing, if I live through this trip and get back here. But until then, let's close in prayer. Our gracious Heavenly Father, again we thank you for your word and for its power, and we thank you that music is designed to praise you, and that its absence shows your judgment and the desolation of the earth because of men who have rebelled against you. Father, we pray that you will give us songs in the night, songs of joy, because you are our God, and we love you. Oh, how little our love is, but we pray that you'll teach us to love you more, 
that you'll make us faithful men and women of God, men and women who sing songs of praise to the Almighty God who loved us and gave his Son to die in our place. Thank you, Father, for your word and for its power. Bless it to our hearts, we pray. In Jesus' name, amen. Our closing hymn in preparation for the Lord's table is number 413, Break Thou the Bread of Life. We'll sing verses 1 and 4. Hymn number 413. Let's stand to sing. find the Apostles Creed we recite that every time we partake of the Lord's table and we'll read it together I believe in God the Father Almighty maker of heaven and earth and in Jesus Christ his only Son our Lord who was conceived by the Holy Ghost born of the Virgin Mary suffered under Pontius Pilate was crucified dead and buried he descended into hell the third day he rose again from the dead. He ascended into heaven and sitteth on the right hand of God the Father Almighty. From thence he shall come to judge the quick and the dead. I believe in the Holy Ghost, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. The Apostle Paul in reminding us of what took place the night in which our Lord Jesus Christ celebrated the Last Supper, the Passover, Pesach, with his disciples, writes and says this, Now in this that I declare unto you, I praise you not, that you come together not for the better, but for the worse. For first of all, when ye come together in the church, I hear that there be divisions among you, and I partly believe it. For there must be also heresies among you, that they which are approved may be made manifest among you. When you come together, therefore, in one place, this is not to eat the Lord's Supper, for in eating every one takes before another his own supper, and one is hungry and another is drunken. What, have ye not houses to eat and to drink in? Or despise ye the church of God and shame them which have not? What shall I say to you? Shall I praise you in this? I praise you not. For I have received of the Lord that which I also delivered unto you, that the Lord Jesus, the same night in which he was betrayed, took bread. And when he had given thanks, he brake it and said, Take, eat. This is my body which is broken for you. This do in remembrance of me. After the same manner also he took the cup when he had supped, saying, This cup is the New Testament in my blood. This do ye as oft as ye drink it in remembrance of me. For as often as ye eat this bread and drink this cup, ye do show the Lord's death till he come. Wherefore, whosoever shall eat this bread and drink this cup of the Lord unworthily shall be guilty of the body and blood of the Lord. But let a man examine himself, and so let him eat of that bread and drink of that cup. For he that eateth and drinketh unworthily, eateth and drinketh damnation to himself, 
not discerning the Lord's body. For this cause many are weak and sickly among you, and many sleep. For if we would judge ourselves, we should not be judged. But when we are judged, we are chastened of the Lord, that we should not be condemned with the world. Wherefore, my brethren, when ye come together to eat, tarry one for another. And if any man hunger, let him eat at home, that ye come not together unto condemnation. And the rest will I set in order when I come. Amen. Whenever we partake of the Lord's table, we like to remind ourselves from this portion of Scripture that this is the Lord's table. It's not our table. It does not belong to a denomination or a particular church, but to the church at large. The Lord Jesus Christ also gave a command. He said, this do in remembrance of me. If you're visiting, you're certainly welcome because this is Christ's table, it's not ours. And if you're a believer, you're commanded to partake. If you're not a believer, there are strong warnings in the passage against partaking, many people think that there's some magic in the elements. Some people have the Roman Catholic idea that, you know, when the host is elevated, that is the cup, the chalice, with the wafer on top under the napkin, and the priest says in the words of the Mass, we offer unto you the only true and living God, that at the moment he utters those words, the priest has the magical power to somehow transubstantiate the host. That's called the host because Christ is the host. And so this then becomes the host in the Catholic view. That's Jesus being present. And so when the communicant takes of the cup and of the bread, which the priest puts to the mouth of each one of them, they are in fact absorbing Christ. That's a blasphemy because Rome teaches that at the moment the priest does that, that Christ is re sacrificed. The book of Hebrews tells us three times that Jesus Christ died once and that it was finished. He died once, once for our sins. It does not have to be repeated ever again. So to say that the priest is re-sacrificing Christ and therefore they call it the perpetual sacrifice of the Mass. Every place around the world, there's a Roman Catholic priest at any hour of the day lifting the host. And so they talk about the perpetual sacrifice in terms of a re-offering, 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 re-offering. Dear friends, that's what it, the Bible denies. It says that's not true because Jesus only had to die once because he's infinite God as well as perfect man. He died once on Calvary's cross 2,000 years ago. On the cross, Jesus didn't say, it's almost finished. He said, it is finished. It is finished. No more needs to be done. It is perfect. It's complete. The sacrifice of Christ is over. By faith, he offers all those who trust in him eternal life. The reason the church celebrates the Lord's table is not for salvation, not for merit, not for obtaining sanctification. The reason the church celebrates this is in memory of what Jesus did. The reason we remember that is because it gives us a motivation to holy living it makes us have a short account of sin. It makes us, when we have sinned, to confess our sins and to get back in right relationship with God. Some of the people there at Corinth were ignoring that. Some of them were hiding sins in their heart. Some of them were refusing to repent. And so they were coming to the Lord's table and gluttonizing and getting drunk and thinking, well, you know, the blood of Jesus cleanses us from all sin, so I don't have to worry about it. I'll just keep right on going. Paul says, what? Shall we sin that grace may abound? God forbid. We that are dead to sin, how shall we any longer live therein? If you've trusted Christ, 
God calls on you before you take the Lord's table to make sure that you have clean hands and a pure heart. And we do that not by partaking, not by going to an earthly priest, but by confessing our sins to Jesus. 1 John chapter 1 tells us if we confess our sins, and it's in the context of confessing them to Christ, you can do that in your heart. You don't have to do that in front of a confessional booth. If we confess our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. That's why we have our preparatory service on Friday. So that if there's someone that you need to make things right with, that it gives you all day Saturday to do it. But even before we partake of the Lord's table, we like to pause for a brief moment of silent prayer so that if God brings something to your mind that you need to get right with him, you have an opportunity to confess it and experience the wonderful cleansing and come to the table with clean hands and a pure heart. We're gonna pause now for a moment of silent prayer that each one of us might open our hearts before God and confess our sins to him. Let's pray. Father, we thank you so much for hearing our prayers, for cleansing us from sin. You've promised to do it. By faith, we believe that you will and have. And so, Father, now as we approach your table, we come in humility, for it reminds us of what Jesus did while we were sinners. He died for us. In Jesus' name, amen. The Apostle Paul gives to us those wonderful words that when Jesus had given thanks, he took the bread and said, take, eat. This is my body, which is broken for you. This do in remembrance of me.